thing. You know, um, the Bible is filled with anthropomorphisms. And again, you know, we've talked about the biblical text. The biblical text needs to be approached with great respect. As the prophet said, be very careful. Don't believe them to be false and don't believe them to be true unless they say something which is clearly indicated in our revelation. But the biblical text is very difficult to deal with. All the letters are written together originally. There is no pointing. There is no fatha. There is no dhamma. There is no kasra. There is no dot under the back. There is no verse separation. It's like, where does the word begin? Where does it end? I can read the Bible in a way that's very different from the rabbi. And if he says something about Ismail, you know, that he is para, meaning that he is an onager, you know, like a, like a zebra, a wild ass, a wild donkey, which are very beautiful in, a, in the wilds. I can read it differently. And I can say he will have many children. Has the same word, which is wafa. In Arabic, it's wafa. In Hebrew, it comes para. It's the same root. But Ismail will have many children. And he will. He has 12 sons. You know, and the sons of Ismail are very important in history. So we have to be very careful about how we read that book. Okay, but it does have anthropomorphism, anthropomorphism in it. And in the history of the children of Israel, you have two captivities. Do you know about that? You have two captivities. The first captivity is in the 8th century BC. And it is in the days of the Assyrians. The Assyrian, Sennacherib. And, and the great, the Assyrians are very interesting in history. And they take all of the tribes of Israel and they enslave them. They conquer them and they enslave them and they scatter them to the winds. That's the end of the 10 tribes. That's the end of the 10 tribes. Then there remains, you know, the tribe of Judah, of Yehuda. You know, who is the son of Jacob? And who is the grandfather of David and of Solomon? And then they have a captivity in the 6th century, the Babylonian captivity, which is more merciful. But the Hebrew language is lost. Moses did not write in the Hebrew script that the Jews use today. Moses wrote in a script that is very different. It's like Greek and Latin. The letter O that we use today is the letter Ayn for them. You know, Latin and Greek come from that script. And that script comes from Thamudic, the language of Thamud, which we know. We, we can study Thamudic today. It's very interesting things. But Hebrew is lost. And when the Jews come back to Palestine, in the day of, days of Cyrus the Great, who was one of the great kings of history, the great Persian emperor, who was a muahid, who believed in the oneness of God. He's an amazing figure in history. Then Ezra brings the Jews back, Hosea. This is a very interesting story. We won't go into that. Very interesting story. And Ezra then gives them the script they use today. And Ezra also translates the Bible to them in Aramaic. Because they don't know Hebrew anymore. They speak Aramaic. And it's amazing how they do that because he avoids every anthropomorphic reference. In everything that in the Bible today is anthropomorphic, he will translate it a different way so that there's no misunderstanding because in the real Hebrew, it was not misunderstood. But in later Hebrew, it's not understood anymore. So the Mutashabiha are very, very important, and we are able to preserve that. Yes.